when things go wrong, is there widespread panic? What happens? Controlled they, they, chaos. Always controlled, though. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what it takes to be an advanced practice provider in neurointervention? I'm Dr. Kimon Beckles, and today I'm joined with two of my favorite people in the Angio Suite. Elizabeth and Amanda are here. Elizabeth, thank you. Amanda, thank you. So they're advanced practice providers. Elizabeth is a nurse practitioner and Amanda is a physician assistant. Amanda, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? We start out uh, by pre op patients in the morning. Um, we do like pre-rounds uh, through the computer and then one of us starts scrubbing with you and the other person will round and um, see consults and whatnot, yes. So the Angio Suite is one component of what APPs would do for, for our field and that would involve scrubbing in procedures, doing interventions with us, assisting, getting the sheath in, the special IV access that we have for the groin, and the other component is taking care of patients throughout the hospital. And so we have patients that are in the hospital that we're following, and then new patients that come in through the emergency room. Tell Elizabeth, tell me a little bit about the acuity of the patients you see, especially when it comes to the emergency room. The acuity can span from, you know, zero to max, I would say. You know, you might have somebody having an active stroke or an active hemorrhage in the brain, and uh, that person needs immediate assistance. Um, and you may have somebody that we can see just as a consult and we may follow up on later on in terms of reviewing uh, vascular imaging and deciding what the plan of care is going to be. Uh, so it depends. Right, and so when it comes to these emergencies, um, for the folks that are interested in entering the field and maybe becoming advanced practice providers, you guys are um, running the show, right? We're frontline. Uh, we basically get called on arrival and then we stay with the patient from the time that they arrive in the emergency room until uh, we take care of their problem. If it's an emergency and they're coming with us, then we're not going to leave their side until they get to where we need them to be. Right. And what kind of what kind of folks do you interact with in that process in terms of what kind of professionals? All levels of the team that's taking care of the patient, the ER bedside nurses, uh, CAT scan techs, uh, stroke coordinator, ER docs, obviously, internal medicine doctors, uh, our team back in the NGO suite prepping for probably a procedure that's going to be happening any moment. Um, the ICU getting a bed ready for the patient after our procedure. So there's all of this going on at the same time. Right. So, so guys, not only do they have to obviously take care of the patient, provide clinical care, but also they have to coordinate everything around them and then interact with other members of the team. I would say it's a, one of the most stressful, but probably rewarding jobs that we have in the Angio Suite because you know, you have your provider, you can, you can affect care, but at the same time, um, you know, you're a member of the team and working with a bunch of other people. And so what's your role in supporting the staff in the room, but also the physician that's doing that procedure? Uh, we're kind of a first assist, I guess, uh, right. with the physician who's doing the procedure. So we go in from the start, we put that special access in so that the doctor can get up and do what they need to do up in the blood vessels. And then uh, we're scrubbed in the case until that patient's done, unless we get called out to another emergency. And then we kind of just flip flop and cover each other. Right. And, and so Amanda, you know, often, you know, us as providers, we're doing something technical. We're looking at what we're doing. We're trying to catheterize an aneurysm, treat a stroke. Um, and, and so you guys are our shadow and often, you know, our eyes in things that we cannot see, right? Like, like, you know, how's the patient doing hemodynamically or the vitals or other things? And what's your role in that aspect? Um, yeah, I think it's important as an APP to be aware of the patient as a whole from start to finish, from the time that we see them in the ER, intraoperatively, um, watching their vitals, knowing what medications are being given on the anesthesia side, we kind of have to have an all-encompassing view of things, um, most importantly, so that we can, you know, be, like you said, your eyes and ears. We typically will uh, talk to the APPs upstairs in the ICU, um, give them a sign out, and then we continue to manage these patients, especially if they're truly a vascular patient, we want to, um, you know, be uh, first on the list of what's going on with this patient. We want to know uh, minute to minute, um, hour to hour, any updates. So, And so obviously what we do is fairly fast paced and uh, when things go wrong, is there widespread panic? What happens? Controlled there? chaos. Always controlled though. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> so tell me about that. So of course people are panicking or not panicking, but acting in a much faster way. And, and what's your role in coordinating all these folks? figuring out a goal to achieve. Right. So it depends on what kind of chaos you know we're trying to coordinate. Um, if it's another emergency in that same patient or um, if there was a medication issue and 
a bet issue, whatever the issue is, um, figuring out the goal um, and trying to obtain that goal. Elizabeth, you're a nurse practitioner. Amanda, you're a PA. So, so tell me a little bit about, obviously, you're both in the same role as, as APPs. And for those of you guys who don't know, uh, APPs can be nurse practitioners, they can be PAs. Uh, so how do, you, how do you get to become a nurse practitioner in the first place? Um, you do have to be a bedside nurse first. Um, a lot of people have different views on how long per se, but definitely if you get a couple of years of experience under your belt, you uh, may fare better, but um, get a few years as an RN. I personally went back to school while I was working full time. So um, I did school part time, took about three years and then uh, came, became an NP. So. And my understanding is for nurse practitioners, there's multiple different options in terms of the final subspecialization. Uh, NP and PA is a little bit different that way, that NP is more of a specialized pathway from the start. So you apply to a specialized program. I am only certified to take care of adults. Right. Um, whereas PAs are more of a widespread training and you kind of choose your path post, if I'm correct. Yeah, Amanda, tell us a little bit about how you become a PA. Um, well, the track is um, more of like a pre-medical sort of track academically, and then you have to apply to PA school. You can do it um, usually if you have enough credits, it's like as soon as three years, um, so a junior in college, um, but most people do it after they have a bachelor's already. Um, and a lot of the programs are master's programs. Once you get into the master's program, it's a didactic section, like 50% of the schooling and then the other 50% is clinical. Excellent. And Amanda, as part of her long career, she was also a professor uh, teaching other PAs how to do um, what they do and eventually become PAs. And so she has a long experience with uh, getting folks through those tough years. You know, obviously when you're interacting and treating patients, there's no, there's no difference when it comes to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. None. No, we have the same exact role responsibilities. Yeah. Right. And so as a PA or a nurse practitioner, you can choose from a million different fields, right? Um, why neuro? Why here? I would say I was lucky enough to fall into it, but I did start out in neurology um, and I found my path back to neurosurgery because I did not like that I didn't have immediate outcomes on my patients. I didn't like that I would prescribe them medication, they'd go out in the world and I wouldn't see them for three months. Here, immediate results, whether they're bad or good, and sometimes it's both ways. Um, you're going to either give a medication and see that result right away, say if you're in critical care, but you're in the NGO suite, you pull out a clot and you see a patient start moving, it's pretty amazing. Right, right. That's pretty spectacular. Amanda, what is it, what is it for you? Um, definitely before PA school, my experience was in a neurosurgery office, um, okay. so kind of, I think, influenced my decisions later on. Um, I don't think neurosurgery is for everybody, but if you like it, you love it. Um, and I, I think that most people can agree with that, and I love it. I don't know. Yeah, why. yeah, that's that's what we say, you know, in neuro, it, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. And when it comes to neuro intervention, my, my pitch to new PAs that are or nurse practitioners that are interested to joining a neuro interventional team is that, you know, you're you're pretty much if you like neuro, you can do everything related to the neuro field. You, you, you dealing with procedures in the angio suite, you're dealing with critical care patients in the neurocritical care unit, you're dealing with emergencies in the emergency room. So you're pretty much doing the spectrum of neuro um, uh, fields that you can you, you can be involved in, you know, because if you, for example, work in an outpatient neurology office, that's all you do. If you work in neurosurgery only, that's all you do. But then in neurointervention, you kind of have that luxury of doing everything. That's what I, at least I tell people that I'm trying to attract to uh, join our team. <laughs> what do you love about your job? Or is there anything you love about your job? <laughs> <laughs> um, the day to day is a little bit grueling sometimes. Right. It's we just happen to run a very busy service. Uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, we stick around for a reason. Sometimes I'm not exactly sure. I have to dig deep. <laughs> I have to dig deep for that reason. But um, honestly, you know, I can go home still at the end of a 12, 14, 16 hour day and say. Uh, there's something I like about my job and it's really it's the patient care it's the interaction with the patients it's the interaction with our team um, you know you could come in at two o'clock in the morning and I've said this since my first middle of the night call and this team is unbelievable people are happy in the middle of the night it's bizarre but you know what it keeps everybody going um, and right. really everyone has the same goal is to take care of the patient um, at the end of the day it's pretty awesome to see the outcomes I think that's probably it for me yeah yeah Amanda what gets you up in the middle of the night and you come here you're probably the happiest person that comes here in the middle of the night. <laughs> so what, what gets you going? Patient outcomes, absolutely. Right. Like I totally agree with what Elizabeth said. Um, not every service do you get to see such rewarding 
immediate sometimes outcomes and that can be just so rewarding. Right. So walk me through a patient that you really love the outcome and kind of inspired you to keep going. There's certain patients that stick with you forever and ever. Um, one that gives me goosebumps still is a young female who was very close to my own age. So I think okay. those are always a little bit tough. Um, yeah. I happened to meet her from the moment she rolled into the trauma room. And, um, you know, I saw her from that moment of when she was extremely weak on one side and we didn't know what was wrong yet. Why is some young, young female having a stroke? Turned out that it was a ruptured AVM. Um, and I stayed with her through the angio suite and then immediately post, she went up to open surgery with right, you. Right. Um, we saw her postoperatively in the critical care unit. We watched her recovery. She went to rehab and you know, um, she's looking unbelievable these days. So right, right. to be able to see these patients come in and out of the hospital for the next six or eight months or so after their initial injury, um, and see that there's good outcomes for a young person who has a young baby at home. Uh, it's pretty unbelievable. They stick with you. I, I say a lot that, that for when it comes to neurointervention, neurosurgery, it takes a special someone to be in that field. And I think all of us are inherently optimistic, right? Because we see these patients, when they come to us, they're not looking their best. Obviously, they're, they're very close. It's the worst close. day of their life. Right. Uh, and they're very close to a devastating uh, deficit or to death sometimes. And... Uh, you know, we emotions to some extent are secondary when it comes to how we interact with them. We are there to do what we need to do, but we're very optimistic. Uh, obviously, if things are not looking good, eventually we're realistic also with the families, but at, at, at initially we're extremely optimistic. And so um, you have to be that to be in this field. And, you know, we've spoken before what it takes to be a neurosurgeon as a physician, but, you know, when it comes to or a nurse, right? Uh, but when it comes to advanced practice providers, same thing. It's a special personality. Uh, it, it comes down to, you know, being inherently optimistic, being able to work under a lot of stress, being able to interact with people. Uh, you mentioned the families. Um, a lot of these people, sometimes you can't interact with the patient themselves because of right. the, their pathology when they show right. up and you're dealing very intimately with their family members from the moment they arrive. And right. so we form those relationships pretty quickly too, I think. Um, yeah. And that's another whole piece to this job. Yeah, no. you kind of. Of course, that. and and you know, it, like I said, it takes it takes a special someone. You know, if you don't have the people skills to deal with that, and I, and and frankly, I, I I applaud you guys. I mean, you know, your ability to kind of multitask and and change from you know talking to a family, consoling a family, then being, you know, in a procedure, doing a procedure, then dealing with the next emergency. It's it's tough, um, and often you know challenging on you. Amanda, what, what about you? What about a patient that stuck with you? Um, definitely a young girl, a pediatric case, um, under 10 years old. Um, and, you know, mom just knew something was off with her, um, kept pursuing diagnosis and eventually went to the right person who got the right imaging. Um, and she was uh, diagnosed with anemia, um, right. which had a large aneurysmal component. Right. Um, we had to, we saw her as an outpatient, so um, you didn't have that emergent, you know, factor, which was sort of nice in the beginning. Right. But then as time went on and we had to treat her, it became more and more challenging because, um, you know, you were afraid she was fine at this stage. Right, right. And when you start to intervene because you want to do something that might potentially save her life, what could happen or what Absolutely. are the possible complications? Thank God she had none. She did wonderful. Um, and it was, it was really good. Great. So you guys are super women at work. How do you decompress at home? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time to decompress at home. <laughs> we go home to all of our boys. We have yes. all boys. Um, I have three. Amanda has two. Five in total. We uh, just go home and love our babies. I think probably we can both say that. Um, yeah. So that's that's another important point, right? It doesn't mean that if you're an advanced practice provider in a challenging field like this, where, you know, when you work, you're working, you know, there's no downtime, you're working 100%. That doesn't mean that you cannot have a family and, and both of them have amazing families. Um, Your families kind of understand that when mommy's at work, mommy's at work and, you know, you, you have support at home that can withstand that. And right. then when mommy's home, you try to really just be present and be home. Some cases stick with you, but you got to learn to leave it at the door sometimes. That's exactly right. Well, ladies, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching. Um, please like and subscribe. Don't forget. And we'll see you again in another video.